<clears throat> okay, I guess that we can start is a 10 minute canonical Berkeley time. Okay, so let's see. Does this work? Okay, so uh, not so great. I don't understand why. Okay, so uh, today we are talking about design methodologies. Um, as your TAs have done, they, they have written you a note. You know, there are new slides in this uh, part. The, the class is going to be rather different from what has been done in the past. So um, please download the uh, new material. So um, as you remember from the first class, uh, methodologies are really uh, the most important part of design. Uh, methodologies is the way in which you organize your thought process and the way in which you um, approach the problem. And if you are rigorous about it and well organized, then the design is going to be much better than if you just go haphazardly and say, okay, let me try this, let me try that, and then check. Right? So methodology is always an intellectual process. And as such, is based on certain principles. Some, most of the methodology are based on very simple principles because way of organizing uh, thought are not that many. And in general, they better be simple. The details are going to be complicated, but the overall framework is simple. And yet, you can always say something new even at that uh, generic level. So we are going to talk about some of the uh, model uh, of uh, designs that have been used in the past. And I would like to give you also some industrial perspective. So who does what in the industry, which companies are using one method, which companies are using the other method, and what we believe is a good approach to design. So, uh, come on. Pardon. Okay. So, um, and I'm going to use, again, an example that I know very well and that, in general, is very appealing because it's something that everybody knows, which is the automobile, right? So now, in, if you look at the challenges today in the development of the, uh, of the car, it's essentially in the electronics part. Uh, today, more than 50% of the value of the car is in electronics. So everybody thinks that the car is a mechanical component, not any longer is an electronic component dressed with mechanical parts. But the electronic part is the most important thing. So when you think about safety, fuel efficiency, reduce emission, without electronics you cannot achieve it. So the big development in the past 20 years has always been on the electronic control side. <clears throat> and of course they, uh, there is a great pressure from government to have the minimum amount of accidents, right? So, or malfunctioning. So, which implies that the parts that are inside a car have to be extremely reliable. So much reliable that, you know, when you're talking about one zero part per million, it's almost an impossible feat to accomplish. Almost, because of course people, they think about it, and then, uh, in the end, they are capable of achieving it. Now, if you want to know my honest opinion about all the advances in automotive, what we're due to, not to the customer. The customer, the only thing the customer cares is about, you know, showing off, so the beauty of the car, <laughs> and two, the entertainment system. Everything else, they couldn't give a damn, right? And so the people who are designing cars that want to make money uh, they don't want to think about safety. They don't want to think about security because nobody is willing to pay for it. After you are dead, maybe you reconsider it. But uh, that is the point. And nor they care about pollution. Uh, maybe 1% of the population do, uh, like some of you may. In Berkeley, maybe 90% of the population does. But in general, in the world, nobody cares. Right? And so the only way in which you are going to introduce innovation is because the government say, either you do this or you don't sell a damn car. Zero, one, okay? So you do it or otherwise you're out of the business. And so the uh, value of regulation is extremely important, not only in this domain, but also 
in another important domain that you may have read on newspapers a lot, is about this net zero energy buildings. So buildings that don't consume energy. They produce and they use their own energy. So this is a goal that the state of California set by year 2018, 2020, that no new building should ever have to consume energy. Okay? So it's a very challenging goal. Uh, now, you may worry about it because you pay uh, the price of energy, but the price that you pay for energy in your home, it is sizable, but it's not that sizable. So thinking that consumers can drive innovation and can drive societal uh, uh, impacts is a dream, right? So you really have to have government um, in uh, input. So uh, as we said before, now it's by 2015, actually earlier, right now it's about 50%, so it's much faster than what was anticipated. And the software share has gone up to 13%. So now the other important thing is the pressure on time to market. Now in the past, to bring in a new car took about five years, right? So you start from the conception, you do the mock-up, then you do the preliminary design, then you do the mule. These are uh, prototype cars that you drive around and you check if something goes wrong, and then uh, many things go wrong, so you, you fix the bugs and so on and so forth. You build another mule, many things go wrong, and you build yet another one, and you build yet another one. So this was the path. So five mules in general, five different prototypes were brought to market. Now, that is impossible to do any longer because the cycle is too long and there are companies that can master new designs much faster time. Uh, if you're interested, I will point, actually, we'll post some slide by Volkswagen uh, and we will see that the methodology that I'm going to present today is what Volkswagen has used, but the time to market of a new Volkswagen vehicle is between six months okay, to a year. Right? So huge improvement. And that is achieved by methodology and by eliminating all these mules. Right? So if you think about when I started my career in 1971, many, many ages ago, what happened is that in, in, you were designing a micro, no, microprocessor not to be seen yet. So it was 1980s when the microprocessor era started. But when you design an integrated circuit, uh, you just made it, then you test it, doesn't work, you fix it, you test it, you fix it, you test it. Now, that was the same thing as uh, automobiles like five years ago, exactly the same. But now, how come that now we don't make mules, quote-unquote, for integrated circuit? Because it costs too much, right? And you want to have the products like cell phones and so on to come out to market really fast. And so what did you do? You revert to what is called virtual engineering. So everything is done on the computer. Most everything, okay? Most everything. There is still something that you have to screw drive around, uh, but hopefully uh, we are not going to need that any longer. Okay, so now, uh, why cars are so interesting? Because the functionality that a car has today is incredibly complex. So what you see here is all kinds of things that you have today so you got ABS, you have uh, electric steering, active suspension, electronic stability, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So many, 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 many different things. Most of the new stuff is related to safety. So uh, things that prevent accident to occur. And there are two kinds of things. One is called passive uh, safety, and passive safety is like the uh, thing blows in your face, an right? airbag, right? So that's a passive safety device. So you have an accident, and they prevent you from dying, okay? That's passive safety. Now, the active safety is that if you find out that you are kind of falling asleep, the car stops or wakes you up, okay? That's active, right? So the, uh, maintaining the uh, distance from the front vehicle automatically is an active action, okay? And so the trend is to go from passive action to active action, and eventually to go to complete, as we said, the first class to complete autonomous driving. Okay, so now, in order to do that, you have tons and tons and tons of devices, 
And of course, you need tons of sensors because in order to see uh, this distance from the guy in front, you have to measure that distance. In order to prevent you from bumping into a bicycle uh, driver, you got to know that the uh, wood you know, on the side. You have recognition, so you have to do image recognition, if you like, if you don't trust the guy to see that that's a cyclist. And then uh, you have to take action based upon that. So tons of, uh, of sensors, so radars, uh, we say the first class radars, cameras, and so on and so forth. Then you have to have a, almost a nuclear computer in there because you have to do a lot of computation. For example, image recognition is not for the faint of heart, right? It takes a lot of computing, okay? Plus, you have to actuate, right? So you have the uh, braking, uh, and you have the steering of the wheels, and so on and so forth. So you have actuator, sensor, computing. Standard embedded system stuff, except that now the number of devices that you have in the car is very, very large. So it's a very distributed system. And you have tons of functionality that you have to, uh, to put into that car. So today, actually we say today, uh, um, Zero minus. So today, a couple of uh, months ago, three months ago, or something like that, the big design methodology for the architecture of the car was to consider one particular box, which means a board, right, for one function. So <coughs> there was the identification of one function, one box. Okay. So it's like you have the, your TV set is separate from your refrigerator, okay? So the same thing in the separate function, separate things. So each time a new function is required, then the guy who's making the car asks his supplier, please make me a box. The box comes in, and the supplier has to integrate this box into his frame. Now, in order to be able to do that, then you have to have a very flexible in, uh, interconnection. Uh, in addition, um, uh, does anyone know uh, how many meters of cable is in a car today? Cabling, so just, just wires going all over. Wild guess. Hmm? How much? Close. Not quite. No, no, not quite, meaning it's more. <laughs> it's twice as much as two kilometers going to four. Now, if you consider that stuff is uh, copper, you multiply <laughs> the kilometers by the average weight of the thing, and you get a lot of weight, which then implies that you are going to consume a lot of fuel just to carry the wires, right? Which doesn't seem to be so wise. Now, so why don't people go wireless? Ha, <laughs> wireless, wonderful, right? So I save tons of money because copper is expensive, by the way. Uh, any any reason why I shouldn't uh, I, I should right and why because you can you know you can hack into wireless but in any case that that is what they tell you but that's not the reason yeah well, I mean it's already connected right we're talking about connected cars you know there are all kind of connections so you know General Motors OnStar you can, if you hack into OnStar you can take control of your car. And it is wireless, by the way. So uh, that is what they tell you is not exactly accurate. What is more accurate is the fact that wireless connection is unreliable per se, meaning that if the sun has decided to be slightly upset, right, so your wireless can be upset. So if you, uh, if you get a signal from a sensor and this is not received because the sun had an emission of electromagnetic something, then you are in a problem. So it's a reliability more than anything else. It's not so much the hacking. It is a consideration. But it's also the electromagnetic compatibility, meaning that you are polluting the environment. I mean, meaning polluting not in the sense that you die uh, carbon monoxide and all that kind of stuff. But you are making the nearby of the car full of electromagnetic radiation. So if another car goes by and is doing the same thing, you get the signals mixed up, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you are runners, but did you ever try to do a, a marathon or something with a lot of people around you? And you have these beautiful things that measure your heartbeat and this and that and up and down and your speed. 
And then all of a sudden you realize that you are making four min mins per mile and you say, great! It's not you, it's the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the same thing, okay? So uh, it's this cross-correlation. But that is a target. I mean, the automotive companies are really thinking hard if that could be achieved. Another way is to have connectivity that is more effective. Now, in the past, the connectivity of these things were mostly point-to-point. And now it's no longer possible to do point to point. So they have networks inside the car, right? And so, in fact, that's the reason why, for example, for embedded system of the new generation, you have to know networking. And so that's the reason why embedded system is so interesting, because you got to know about technology, so the sensor technology, what is around, what is possible to do with the sensor accuracy, drifting, uh, reliability, and all of that. Plus, you have to know networking. Plus, you have to know computing. So it's a lot of stuff that you have to know. So this class is a little bit of everything, right? So in the past week and a half, you have heard about interrupts and this and that, which is pretty low-level stuff, right? Is how to uh, make a microprocessor work, right? Uh, uh, now we are going to see how you do design methodology. It's a pretty abstract thing. So. It is a, uh, a very complex and interesting field just because of the diversity that you have in front of you. Now, the interesting thing is that today is based on that because OEMs, so the BMW, Mercedes, and so on of this world, didn't know much about electronics at all. So they needed somebody else to provide the boxes. Now, what happens is that if you realize that electronic is the key to the competitivity of your car, then you don't want other people to determine whether you can sell more car or not. You would like to be in charge, right? Not only, but the value that the OEMs are capturing by this thing is very large. The margins of the tier one suppliers are much higher than the margins. So big mess, right? So the OEMs say, wait a minute, who sells the car? Who makes the car? So we have to have the, uh, um, how to say, the benefit of this. So we are going to control, right? So no more the tier one supply. But if you say one box, one function, the OEMs are always going to screw you. No, no question about it, okay? So the big thought about the OEMs about 15 years ago was we take control. So now on, the architecture of the car is us, okay? A new OEM has to comply to what we tell you, okay? So by doing that, they had to bring in a lot more uh, in, in intellectual capabilities about the electronic design, but in a different form, because it's about integration. Anyway, so this one is, uh, uh, the results was a proliferation of ECUs. Now, if you take a, a BMW top of the line, it's about 100 ECUs, which means more than 100 microprocessors in a car. Okay, so you talk about you know, complexity and, and power, computing power. That is really uh, something to, uh, to work on. So uh, there is a lot of cross-functional side effects, all kind of that stuff. Um, uh, that is going on, and of course there are missing opportunities for commonalizing the stuff that is becoming commodities by now. And in fact, if you start thinking that the electronic component is a real um, interesting novel part, for example, if you think about engine control, so the actual engine, right, is a commodity, because more or less everybody does the same. So why don't we buy standard functions of engine control? So that, that's the the idea that was uh, going around. So tomorrow, and actually uh, almost today, the idea is integrated modular architecture. Now, what does it mean, integrated modular architecture? So if I give you, right, so today, as you are after one week of, uh, of class, so maybe you don't have the feeling for these kind of things, but if I tell you, I want to uh, reduce the number of ECUs. 100 is too many. But I want to use the same functionality as I used before. So what would you do? You had, say, 150 functionalities and 60 microprocessors. What can you do? What do you have to do? You have to put more functions on the same thing, right? 
One more thing. If you want to make your car more resistant to failure, right, what would you like to do? Redundancy, but in what sense? Because we have reduced the number of processors. How can you achieve redundancy? That's it. So you have the same functionality implemented the same component. So there is no more, no, no matter how you look at it, there is no more correspondence one function, one um, object, right? In two ways. One is that one object, one uh, ECU can carry more than one function, and that one function can be distributed over several components, right? So there is no more correspondence. Now, if that is the case, Really, the car manufacturer is the guy that calls the shot, right? Because he has a complete vision of all the application. And so what will be the game? What is the game of the OEM to, to reach this conclusion? Is the fact that he will ask the tier one supplier to give him pieces of the architecture, so some of his ECUs, right? So just the hardware, just the hardware. Maybe the operating system on it. Yes. That's it. And to some other provider, they will ask the software. And then the coupling of the software with the platform is done by the OEM. And this is Autosar. Autosar is a big deal. You know, it's a huge consortium of everybody plus his brother that is thinking about this integrated modular architecture. Uh, okay, so the execution architecture is completely selected and planned by the OEM. The OEM are free to, to standardize anything they want. And each time a new function is required, the OEM starts a request of a supplier for a new functional content, software, to be integrated with the rest. Now, this achieves two goals, right? So one is we already said. I mean, it's the fact that you um, reduce the power of the supplier. The second thing that um, it uh, uh, achieves is the flexibility. Now, for example, if uh, how many times do you upgrade the software on this baby. Right? So maybe once a day. Right? So there is the fixes of the operating system. There is iTunes that gives you just now, you know, 100 megabyte of stuff, you know. And it happens every time, right? So think about the same thing for cars, right? So what happens is that you can make your car go faster, for example, by downloading a new engine controller. Not that I, you know, advocate this. But in principle, you could do that, right? Uh, so that, that is uh, uh, flexibility that you can gain. So there is a new thing that you are putting in, and then you connect to the rest. And the challenges are moving from specification of ECUs to specification of software. Now, what is the most serious problem when you do that? Now, if I had, uh, you know, standard computing things, I can always do this. We have been doing it for 30 years. So why is more critical in the automotive domain? to do this, this approach, right? So I add a piece of software, slap it in, into the existing platform, and everything works fine. What is the problem? What is one of the problems, or actually the most serious problem? And this will bring also to a very important component of the class, uh, of the teaching that we are doing to you. So what is going to be a problem? So when you have safety critical Things. What do you need to worry about? Of course, right. And yeah, the, given the fact that functionally, also Microsoft is always correct, right? So, you know, okay, let's give that as given, right? Correctness is fine. But correctness, functional correctness, right? And we are talking about so in the sense that it does what it's supposed to do. But there is one thing. Yes, 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 yes. Performance is timing. Now, if I give you a platform that exists already, and there is software that runs on the damn platform, then I put in another function, who guarantees me that the timing is going to be maintained, right? Now, do we have a good way of modeling timing in microprocessor? The answer is N-O, no. Because all these babies are based on best effort. So you hope that it's going to go fast, and the faster, the better, but you don't know how long it's going to take. There is no intrinsic mechanism that is guaranteeing you that the time is correct, right? So the most important thing is 
if you do this, this approach, is to guarantee that you add something to something that already exists and you are not disturbing time. My God, you know, that's not easy at all. So being able to characterize the time which is associated with the execution of a particular piece of software on an existing platform where other things are running is of paramount importance. So this is a basic challenge that you need to face. It's a technical challenge that is a lot of research associated to it even today. Okay? So it's not a solved problem. It is approachable, but it's not a solved problem. Now, uh, of course, how did we cope with complexity? We already did this. Uh, we have abstractions, we have tools, and most of all is with methodologies, which are freedom from choice. Now, timing, by the way, could be approached in some sense. I mean, at least you can have an idea on what's going on. If for the communication in the network uh, of the car, you are using time division multiplexing. TDMA, right? Why time division multiplexing? Because, you know, it's based on a synchronous assumption, and there are time slots, so you know how it's much easier to control if you are staying within a uh, boundary of the cycle or not. So using a rigorous, uh, a, rigor, a uh, restricted uh, method for uh, uh, communication is a potential solution. So, in fact, if you look at the uh, most imp important evolution of the automotive field, um, you have that everybody is directing their attention to synchronous protocols. So you hear about what is called TTA, uh, which is Time Trigger Architecture, which is TDMA. Okay? Now you hear about time, TTP, Time Trigger Protocol. You hear about TT Ethernet. This is an interesting one. Why? Because when you say, I want to have a synchronous execution right, of something, does that imply that your actual wiring and networking be synchronous or not? No. What I can do is that I can write a layer, an abstraction layer, that will make my application look the connectivity and the protocols as being synchronous. But in reality, they are asynchronous. So the actual mechanism is asynchronous. But the abstraction is synchronous. I can still predict timing. Okay? Now, same thing. When you do uh, synchronous design in uh, uh, electronics, you know, just simple microprocessor stuff, uh, you... Uh, how do you accomplish it by the introduction of a clock, right? But the transistor per se are asynchronous, right? So when the signal propagates, right, between registers, it goes at its own speed, right? Whatever. But the key assumption is that when you read the data that have been written by this asynchronous process, these data are stable. And that is the basic assumption of synchronicity. So you can always, the world is asynchronous. So the, what surrounds us is based on real time, meaning physical time, which is a real number, plus a synchronicity. Right? So we make it synchronous by restricting our use of the components. So it's freedom from choice. So it's a restriction of what we do. Now, this one is the V model. Now, anyone who is anyone in industry has heard of the damn V model. Now, for me, it's one of the most horrible things ever done, but at least it's some kind of thing that helps people to reason about things. But that is not a good way of doing things, and I'll articulate why that is the case. But if you read any book of anything, or you read any paper from industry and the like, everybody is going to say, oh, we use the V model according to the V model, we do this, we do this, we do this. Besides the fact that it's not true, but it's really not good. Right? Now, what is the V model idea? Now, notice that this started in the 60s, and guess who invented it? Any, any idea? It's kind of funny, because I, I thought it was the automotive industry. No was the defense industry, but which country? The United States, he would say. No, it's Germany. So the Germany, uh, 30 years ago, 
or more, and said, OK, this is the way in which the design process goes on. And their view of the design process is purely a linear process. You go from the idea or conception of your system. You go from the functional implementation. You choose the architecture. You do the final application. You integrate everything. And then you test. Right? So that's the reason why it's called V-model. This is a design phase, and then there is a verification phase. Right? Design, verify. Why is that? Of course, you need to test during design. This is the solution. But what is the problem of doing zoom, zoom? At the end, right? So you have to redo your design. You know what your original design is going to be. And that was the main, uh, one of the major reasons. The second thing is that what if you wanted to reuse part of your design that you had before? You can do it, right? Because you are starting top down, right? So you go boom. And if you hit something that you already had before, hallelujah, but may be completely different, right? So it's, it's, uh, this one is, uh, in some sense, and nobody for that reason really is using the V-mode, okay? But it was possible to use it when the complexity was such that you didn't need to verify right away. This was when uh, we said before, you had uh, the rapid prototyping, you were measuring things after you build it, and you could debug after you build, okay? So that was okay, was not great, but was okay. Today is not good. Yet, most of the people use it, okay? This is a very interesting point, because if you look at the system industry, after all, system industry is what is producing very interesting products, and the products that we use in our everyday life, forget about cell phones, but everything else, or computers, but everything else, if we do use anything else, rather than computers and cell phones. But assuming that we do, then most of that stuff is developed with methods and approaches that are 40 years old, right? So it's scary. Right? Really sc airplanes are done this way. Ooh, airplanes. Yes, airplanes. Okay. So, uh, so you develop a subsystem, mechanical parts, the ECU, the software, the implementation, then tum, 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 you verify. Um, now, uh, many of you have pointed out already that the issue is, is um, finding the error late is a disaster. Now, look at this. Dang. This is a demonstration. So the stage one at the requirements assume that finding a bug costs one. Uh, to find the bug at software design costs five. In uh, looking at maintenance, so after you send out the, the product and you discover that there is an error, it costs 500. So 500x the cost of discovering a bug. So the sooner you do it, the better it is. So this is not a good way. And so what do you do? Well. You want to bring verification as early as possible in the design process, as simple as that. Now, if I'm, you, you see why the V-model was uh, proposed when you were doing prototypes, right? Because you'd go all the way to the final product when you test it because you have the thing, right? That you want to see if it works or not. Now, we say that doing that is expensive, so all of a sudden you start thinking, okay, if I don't want to do the prototype, what do I have? The only thing I have is a computer. And the only thing I can do is to do it abstractly. The only thing I can do is to use mathematical models, which implies, though, that I can do verification early. But there is no need to, to wait until I have the entire thing to do the testing, because in the computer world, everything is virtual. So I can do anything I want at any time, even if I don't have the actual piece. So all of a sudden, you can do the small Vs or the small, the small v in big V. So which means that every step has its own loop. Let's say I design, check, fix, and move. Okay? So this is the, the process that actually most of the people are moving into. Now, in order to be able to do that, though, you have to have a way of evaluating what your platform is going to do to your implementation, right? And so what you need is a model of the component of the platform. So the model of the computers, the model of the cabling, and all of that. 
And if you want to reuse some pieces of your design that you had uh, five years ago and so on, that can be wonderful because the models that you have for the platform are going to be very accurate. And so whatever you're going to do in the first phase of the design is going to be reflecting much better the final implementation. So this is the way. Okay? So to do verification early, try to model what is going to happen in the future, right, in terms of the selection of the component and so on. All right. So now we come to the platform-based design concept. Now this one turns out uh, we, we proposed it like 25 years ago, but uh, by now it is the way in which things are done. Now I, um, I completely forgot to insert the slides of the presentation of the CEO of Volkswagen uh, just a few months ago, where he said that the only way in which Volkswagen is going to do their vehicles is to use platforms and to use platform-based design. So the interesting thing is that this is not only for the electronic part, but also for the mechanical part. So what does it mean to have a platform? The idea, in some sense, is that I want to have something that is mostly done, right? So that I have available. And I want to produce a new product by doing minor adjustments, right? But adjustments that are enough to fulfill the need of a customer. So, for example, in a Volkswagen case, in the mechanical part, what they did is that they fixed the design of the front part of the car, you know, the axle, the front axle, of the back, the back axle. The thing that they left free, according to the models of their car, is the distance between the axle. That's it, right? So you customize your car by varying this parameter. So that is really freedom from choice. So you tell all your car designers, this is it. This component, don't touch it. Don't even dream about it. You can vary this if you want. And I'll tell you which tools to use and how to do that. Very constrained, right? But this is a key to get more model correctly in the market really well. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, the other important point of uh, platform-based design is the fact that the, uh, a design is always based on two parts. The part is what I want to do, so the function that I want to achieve. For example, safety, I want to make sure that I maintain the distance, right? And how I do that, right? So I, then how I do that is the hardware platform, if you like, right? It's the kind of things that I use to be capable of sustaining this application. So, for example, if I want to maintain the distance, what I need is a sensor that is measuring the distance, right? How many such sensors there are? Many. But there are a limited number of. So if I don't want to invent a new sensor, I have a library of sensors. Each one of them is characterized by a cost, by performance, accuracy, for example, by time, response time, and all that. And so according to my goals of my functional design, I will choose that sensor rather than that or rather than that. But I have a, a method right now of selecting the components of the platform. So in some sense, the platform is the combination of all the elements that I have in the libraries. Right? And that's, that's all there is. Right? So now, if you think about, as some of you know about uh, designing uh, electronic circuits, the ASICs, right, and the application-specific integrated circuits, are designed, the digital part, based on gates, right? Now, most of the people use logic synthesis, so synthesize from a functional description into the implementation by selecting gates out of the fixed library. It's the same concept, which brings me to the point that I told you before, that design methodologies are good across a wide variety of different applications. It's a way of organizing your thoughts. Now, why, am I why did I propose this method 25 years ago? Because in my opinion was capable of capturing this separation of function and architecture, or function and platform on one side, and the other side of the fact that you can do the design by at every step selecting 
out of the library something and coupling it with the functionality that you need to um, select. Okay? Now, uh, if you frame your uh, uh, thinking in that way, you immediately realize that this methodology is not like the in which you go from the top and you go all the way to implementation, but is a meet in the middle. Why it is a meet in the middle? Because my requirements come from the top, is my goals, what I want to do with my design, and the bottom-up part is the libraries. Right? So that is something I have available. Right? It's an existing design that I characterize, and I decompose it in terms of these basic beautiful components. Now, in order for this thing to work, I need to have all the components in the library that can be plugged together, right? So I have to tell you if this component can be mixed with this component, they can go together or not, because otherwise I run the risk of putting two things that don't work together, right? So remember the Lego block with kids? I, you know, I remember very well, I mean, when I was for whatever, right? I was trying to put Lego blocks that had separate uh, different shapes, right? And so it wouldn't fit. That's it. Right? That's exactly the same concept. The Lego blocks were the first example of platform-based design with the connection, right? With the rules about how you put together things. So you must have to do this. You have a functional model, so an abstraction, what the system is supposed to do. An architectural model is what describes what you can choose. And the mapping. The mapping is that process of taking the functionality and distributing it on the platform, on the hardware platform. Yes? So this already have a platform. Aha, I knew. Next slide. <laughs> so now I, I give you a challenge. So this is a very good question. Now, how would you solve that problem? So I have a platform I'm existing, so I have a bunch of components, but I want to innovate. Right? So do I want to innovate everything? Probably not. So maybe a piece, right? A critical piece that I had a great idea about. So how would I solve that problem of introducing a new piece in there? Any wild idea? There is a way, of course. Uh, the interface certainly, right? So for example, if I want to introduce a new piece, I want to make sure that the interfaces are, when I design that piece, that the interfaces comply with the rest of the, of the world, right? Or where I want to put it, right? That's one. Second thing is that how do you then, how do you organize your design for that piece? So one thing is very right. Is first thing you have to think is the interface. Now, the other thing that you need to, to, to think about, how do you go about it? Yeah, so the first thing that you want to do is that you want to have, you know, why do you want this part? You want to because it does something right, with a certain characteristic. Right? So you put in the functionality plus the requirements. Right? Now, what is the difference between a new object and an existing object? The existing object, it can already tell you what it can do, right? what performance can support. You know, is a, when you have a, a book where you read, you know, when you design electronics, is a, is a uh, data sheet. Right? So it has all you want to know. Now, for a new component, it doesn't exist, right? The data sheet is actually your requirements. It's what you tell it to do, right? It doesn't exist. So that's the way you, you pose the problem, right? So you pose the problem by saying, by postulating that you have a piece that does what you want, right? And so what you do is that you give to the guy who's supposed to, he is the guy who's supposed to design your new piece, right? He is, he has the constraints from you. And then he's going off and doing that design. Now, if he's capable of doing it, he's coming back to you and saying, here it is. Now, you know that he is capable of doing that. It works because you had designed it in that way. So you don't need to do the integration anymore. And you don't need to verify the integration because it's correct by construction. Right? Suppose he cannot do that. You say, ah, I cannot do that. So he comes back and says, this is the best I can. Then you have to reaccommodate the top level design, and this is the small v, right? Okay, so that's the way you do it for. Uh, so. And the question also is, how do you design a platform? So this is this yes. platform-based design? Yes. 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 Yes
Yeah, well, okay. So first of all, what is the definition of a platform, right? So uh, if you think about it and how people use it, you can have all kinds of different things, right? So a platform, for example, for some people is, uh, is an, a, a, an architecture, a given architecture as a platform. Uh, do you think that is a restrictive definition? It is, right? Because it's, it's one only thing that you have available to you. It is a special case, right? So what you would like to, to think about, remember what Volkswagen did, right? So thank God they call it platform-based design, so it's good for me. But the, the key point is that they are, they have a flexibility, right? And so you have to determine what is the flexibility that you want to give to your platform. So a platform is not any longer a single piece, but is a family of pieces that satisfy a set of requirements. For example, he very rightly said that the interfaces, right? So one constraint of the platform would be that all interfaces are synchronous interfaces, you know, this sort, right? So the pins have to be arranged this way, the other way, so on, right? So that is a constraint. So that is a way of constraining the choice, freedom from choice, right? Now, it's interesting that most of the company I'm working on today are coming from the point of view of doing custom design. The system companies love to do custom design, especially the big ones, right? So they say, oh, my customer wants this. I say, it takes 10 years, right? I mean, suppose that you want to do the power distribution system of an airplane, right? I mean, Jesus, a big design, right? And I say, oh, my customer Boeing wants this, and Airbus wants that. So I have to do two different designs. Say, so wait a minute. Power distribution is power distribution, right? So you have different constraints, right? Performance, maybe size, weight, whatever. But it is power distribution. The function is the same, right? Constraints may be different. Function is the same. Why can't I organize my design using the platform? Which means I have previous designs. I have components of the design sitting around. And the first thing I'm going to try is, is to see whether I can plug in my different components and satisfy Boeing when I already satisfied Airbus. Where is the difference? I may choose different components. But they all come from the same set, library, right? So I save a ton of money and a ton of time, right? Instead of starting from scratch all the time. So the name of the game in any of these big system companies today is reuse. But if you don't put this framework around the reuse, then you run the risk of constraining too much. And then you are not able to follow the technology advances and this and that and up and down. So that's where the intelligence in design goes, right? It's the architect of the design has to choose what are the components, what are the rules. And when you are allowed to add a new component. Right? As you pointed out, what do we do with new components? There you go. So there is a librarian. Is this is exactly what I'm doing today. Right? I'm writing a paper for the UTC that does that. Okay? So thank you for asking. Uh, I was on top of this. Okay. All right. So, um, so the, just to give you another rendition of what I'm talking about, the difference between the platform, which is a family of solutions, which are parameterized by the library, and the behavioral components on the other side. So what you do is that you have a representation of a behavior, representation of a platform, and the design progresses by allocating functionality to the platform, okay? So which is this, mapping. So now when you refine your design, it's always a process of marrying pieces of things you want to do with pieces of stuff that can do things. It's like you have wine and you have glasses, right? And then what you do is that you pour the wine in the glasses. The glasses have capabilities of a size, how much wine you can put in the damn glass, right? And what are the characteristics of the glass? I, I think that some of you may know that uh, in, in, uh, for good red wines of age, you need a glass that is made like this. Why? Because there is a performance associated to it, and the performance is oxygenating the red wine. Now, if you put like this, a white wine, you kill it, right? 
you may realize that I like wines. Okay? And so there is a reason why for every wine there is a different kind of glass. And that is platform based design, it is best, right? So you got the bottle, you got the glasses, you open your drawer and say, okay, what glasses are best for this bottle? Same thing, no difference, the same. So platform based design of drinking wines. Okay. So now, in order to evaluate if your design is good or not, you have to do performance analysis. It's not enough to do correctness of the functionality, it is extremely important to verify that the performance are okay. Why? Because in embedded systems, or in general in cyber physical system, the performance are key to the correct working of the system. Because if I give you a signal from the crash to the airbag that is delayed, you die, right? It can't be. It has to be that timing or less, whatever, because otherwise you have very serious con consequences. So with respect to many other applications, Embedded systems do have to take into consideration performance to evaluate the correctness of the design. There's one very few cases in which this is true. All right. So then you refine in the sense that if you like it, then you marry the functionality to the blocks. But now you may have some virtual block, and you need to repeat the same reasoning one level below. When you have everything that is available, you say, I'm done. Anytime you still have pieces to work out, you go down, right, in the process. So and now, if the performance analysis says bad, then you come back and you change something. You change the functionality, you add a new component, you, change, you buy a more expensive processor, uh, you put more memory, whatever, right? And at the end of this process of evaluating alternative and so on, when you are satisfied, you go on and you go to implementation. So this is another way, yes. It's an architecture, call it, right? Yes. So, in fact, another way of looking at, uh, at things, you know, there is always a functional view, and a functional view, for those of you who are more advanced in terms of uh, computer science and all that, is like a declarative language. And this is what I want to do. So, in, in mathematical terms, I say, I want to find x such that f of x is equal to zero. I don't tell you how. This is a characteristic of my solution, right? Or I can tell you, use the Newton Russell algorithm. What I'm doing is giving you a solution, and that solution is a connection of sub-algorithms, right? And so the, uh, the platform has a component which is structural, and structural means that there are components that are connected together, okay? So the components and their interconnection is characterized a platform instance because the platform is the integral of all possible combinations. Right? given by, by the light. One single connection with the wires and the blocks and all of that is one instance of the main solutions. Right? So that's the reason why I call it platform instance. Why? And that's the reason why I was saying before that that is a special case right? when, you, when we discuss it. Okay. All right. So now, if I take this view that I just gave you, right, of, the, of this function architecture marrying and so on, I take the view that I gave you of the platform, which was like the hourglass, right? In fact, they are called ASV triangles with my initials or the hourglass model because it looks like an hourglass, right? Now you twist it around and you have a bow tie model. It's the same, but just twist it around so that you can, uh, can uh, underline the uh, importance of this process of, uh, 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 you know, functionality in architecture and marrying. So the platform is a library of resources, right? It's an infinite, uh, infinite, it's a finite set of potential solutions. And notice with interfaces that identify legal interconnection. As you pointed out correctly, that is the key, uh, a key part of the, of the um, methodology. Then you have resources. These resources do contain virtual components that are components that do not exist. Placeholder, I want to design things that have that capability. Very important resources are interconnection and communication protocol. Now, the interfaces depend on the interconnection, right? So because when I want to in interface, I, uh, it's a special case that I want to interconnect with, with him, uh, Martin, directly, right? Uh, I may want to 
interconnect through a network, and then the network interconnects to Martin, to you, and so on, right? So the network is a really important thing because we are talking about distributed system. Okay. So, and this is what I call the fractal nature of design because the process repeats always equal to itself at all layer of abstraction. We said before the component is, doesn't exist, so I have to implement it, and I'm going to do the same thing all over again, right? And so you can go down up to the atom level if you want to, right? So the reasoning is always the same. So now, this reasoning also implies that you have to have, I mean, you cannot do all this analysis that I was talking about, the correctness, the seeing if things can be plugged together, and so on and so forth, unless I have a mathematical representation right, of all these processes. Because this is a way of organizing your thought, but when I go down and do it, really do it, I need tools. And tools are based on mathematics, because computers, that's what they're capable of doing, and mathematics implies representation of the world in mathematical terms. Okay? All right. So this is a design method. This is a fractal nature of design, as we said, for automotive. So you have vehicle level, level subsystem level, ECU node level, and down all the way to silicon level. And the top-down part is the part that refines the specification, and the bottom-up part is what exports the characteristic of the components that you have available or that you are designing. So that's the reason why it's meet in the middle, right? You have a top-down, bottom-up process that keep on going at all time. Okay. Now, this one is uh, uh, another rendition of what you can do with this view. This one is a platform. You have network and computing elements. That is the representation, your functionality. Now, question, uh, one million dollar question. The stuff that you see there is the functionality, right? Is it? Yes, it is what you need to do. Now, is that an architecture or is that a functionality? Hey, 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 hey. Is it? Eh? Get in there. Think, think, think. Anyone volunteers? Yes? It doesn't depend on the layer. Not really. The, the key point is that an architecture is always a combination of subsystem or subcomponents. So what you see up there is an architecture of function, is an architectural view of the functionality of the system. It's already decomposed into parts. And so the, the fact that you can have a platform that sits all the way up here, right? So in some sense, that is a platform that comes from yet another layer on top of it that says, I want my car to drive, right? And to, to go on the street and not to have accidents, right? And that is a way in which I'm going to decompose, you know, that requirement into pieces, right? Parts that I'm going to implement. So the concept of architecture is independent of the fact that you have hardware or software. It can be also software architecture. In fact, many people talk about software architecture. Yes. So just to verify, uh, does this live in the top part of the hourglass or the bottom part of the hourglass? Ha ha. Close to the middle. Ha ha. Remember what I say, fractal nature of design, right? So this one, if you look at it, the top level functionality and this view here is, is this view is the bottom and the uh, denotational description of what the car should do is the top. Next layer down, what we are talking about here, well, that one is the top, and that one down is the bottom. So that is the point. Depends at what stage of your design process you are sitting. So everything can be the top or the bottom. It depends where you are. OK. So uh, now you, you see the marriage. Right? This is a mapping. So I'm marrying functions. Yes, Nikunji, you have a question? No, it's a collection of architectures, remember. It's a collection of architectures. Right. But it sounds like that what the result out of the platform is the architecture, but what, what the library that we have is actually components with no connection, but just some interfaces. Right, correct. So, uh, Very correct. It, uh, it sounds like that the library that we have should not have architecture, but it should just have 
No, no, in fact, in fact, the library, as I said before, the library are the components of the architecture. And, and in fact, in the library, not only you have to put the blocks, but you have also to put the connections. The connections are elements of a library. Remember what in the previous slide. So, for example, you could say that in your, uh, you are considering in your car, and in fact it is, right? If you look at the car today, you open it, you see at least three different networks that are going on. There is a CAN network, the LIN network, and sometimes there is a flex rate. So there are three different networks. The, the LIN network is the one that connects with the sensors, it's point to point. The CAN network is the network, asynchronous network that has been used forever in automobiles. And then the third one is flex ray is, is time trigger, partially time trigger architecture that is the first attempt of the automotive industry to move to uh, synchronous architecture. Yes? So we said the entire diagram is an architecture, but each individual block is a function for a sub-architecture. Yes. Okay. Yes. You have it. But also the blocks that are in the library are the parameterization of all the components that you can build out of this. Right? Okay. Uh, so this is a mapping. So when you marry the various functions onto the ECUs, then you assume execution parameters such as jitter, latency, accuracy, worst case execution time. You assume the load and utilization levels, resource usage, and then you map the two. So in summary, what did we learn? Virtual engineering is taking over. No more uh, rapid prototyping, okay? Very little of it. So most of the design approaches are based on virtual engineering. So uh, virtual testing on mathematical models, that's what is done. Top-down linear process is not the way to go, never has been. It was a way of organizing thoughts when you had real prototypes, not virtual prototypes. And verification was only possible when you had the piece in your hand. Um, design is a meet in the middle process. So you have the specification from the top, and you have what is available from the bottom. Uh, the essential part of any design methodologies, let that be the model, horrible, or platform-based design, wonderful, is, uh, is the fact that you have to have models, right? Because any virtual approaches has to have models. And so now... We are diving into the modeling part of the class. Okay. So this is to explain why models are important. Right? Now, you may have heard, and you heard a lot, about model-based design. So model-based design is actually any methodology that is based on models. But in reality, the term model-based design came from a specific approach to design, which was a particular step that was to go from a mathematical model to software code automatically. So to compile software out of a mathematical representation. MATLAB, simulating description, code, C code. Okay? That was that transformation, right? that uh, rewriting of the model into code that would go directly into the microprocessor, that process, which is called also code generation, or code synthesis, whatever you want to call it, that was or historically called model-based design. Then people kind of extended it to everything plus his brother, but that's where it was coming from. So it's not a general design methodology. It's a generic term, if you want all the possible methodology, or it is related to a very specific set of the steps of the design process. So what is modeling? So, well, we know modeling is, okay, I have a system, I'm trying to represent it in such a way that I can predict what this system is going to do when I deploy. So, you do models because you want to be able to explain and predict. So, a model that explains but does not predict is not good, right? Because clearly, it is following too much what you see and not what the truth is. So in any process of modeling, uh, modern modeling, uh, like, for example, machine learning and uh, approximations and all of that, there is always this aspect. There is the training set and there is the test set. The training set is the data I give you to build your model. And then there is the test set which verifies 
if what you wrote can predict. Now, how come that we came to quantum mechanics? I mean, Newton was pretty good, right? Newton mechanics, we can design things with Newton mechanics, and all of a sudden, quantum mechanics. Why? Because Newton mechanics was not capable of predicting behaviors that we observe when we started looking at atoms and all that kind of stuff. So the uh, theoretical physicist had to invent a new model. And by the way, that new model had to contain as a special case, Newton. Now, what is the difference there? It's a difference of scale. Right? Newton is macro. Quantum mechanics is micro. It's a refinement, right, in some sense. But it also explains the macro, because the macro is based on abstractions of the micro. Right? Now, which means that modeling is also dependent on the level that you place yourself. Right? Now, if you want to uh, cope with a very large system, would you rather stay at the micro level or at the macro level? Micro, macro level, yeah, of course, right? But what is the problem with the macro level? No, 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 that's not the question of my composition, lack of compositionality. It's fidelity. Fidelity means the capability of predicting. So at the macro level, you may, f you know, what does it mean macro level? It means that micro level describes everything yeah, that you know. It's the lowest level on which you can detect or you know what is going on, right? In order to abstract, what do you need to do? What is the basic operation that you are going to do? Leave out stuff, right? You leave out stuff, right? You forget about things, right? So the question is that, are the things you forget important or not? So the art of modeling is detecting what is necessary at that level of abstraction. Okay? So there is not a real truth or real true model. A model is only valid with respect to the question that you are asking the model to answer. So, for example, the SPICE model for circuit is an aggregated model of what is going on at the level of electrons and holes in a transistor, right? Now, do we need to, to understand how a circuit behaves to go to the electron and holes? No. But now we know that, right? We know that doing a particular abstraction and working at the ordinary differential equation level, we can do a lot of stuff. Okay? So, uh, and that is the beauty of circuit simulation, is the capability of abstracting things out. And now, when you design digital circuits, do you need ordinary differential equation or not? No. What do you do? Which kind of representation do you use? Boolean, right? Booleans, right? Zero ones, right? Booleans. Uh, plus you can put delays and that kind of stuff. But Boolean, right? And Boolean is representing the fact that the transistor switches, right? It goes close, open, right? Almost close, almost open, right? Because you have resistances, capacitance. And so but for the goal of Detecting if your logical implementation is correct, a Boolean representation is plenty good enough. So if you go one more level down, you're dead. I mean, you can never tell if your digital circuit works or not. Right? So the abstractions are essential, and the art of the abstraction is the capability of leaving out the stuff that you don't care about. Okay? So that's there. So, uh, so imitate system process or artifact of interest. The mathematical model is a model in the form of a set of equations. Okay, good. So now, in the design methodology that I presented you, what do we need to model? Everything. We need to model functionality, but also the components, the sensors, the actuators, the uh, ECUs, and so on. And then we want to construct, possibly, the implementation from the model. So this model-based design. So you have a model, and you want to implement this model into physical processes. Now, this also sometimes explains why you have weird effects in your design, is because when you analyze your design, you made some assumptions that are not really verified in reality. Okay. So the key to platform, and by the way, just because of that, you know, you forgot about certain things, right? So what is uh, the most important thing that people forget about is the environment. So it's what surrounds the design. You are designing a piece, 
And then you are making assumptions about what is around you. Right? So, for example, if you build a car, you assume, for example, assume that you build a car with free steering wheel. Now, will that work or not? Free steering wheels. So, in order to make it go, you need free steering. Of course not. We don't have six arms, right? And so, that is an assumption that the driver is going to have two arms, right? Seems silly, but that's what it is, right? Is that you have to assume what is surrounds you, what surrounds you, right? And so, the most difficult part is modeling the environment. So, to predict what the world is going to do to your design, okay? So, but, well, in any case, the key to platform-based design, we said before, components, composition rules, refinement rules, and abstraction rules to build the model, okay? Now, uh, there is a very interesting uh, thing that is coming out, and this one is rather a dance, so we just quoted it. It is the last um, uh, fashion. Everybody's talking about this stuff. It's contract-based design. Now, contracts, what the heck is a contract? Right? Well, we know, right? So, if, for example, if I want to sell you a, a piece of land, I'm going to represent that that land has certain properties, this big, this lines, and so on and so forth. And you buy based on the assumption that I gave you the inf right information. Right? That is a contract. And so, if that assumption is right, the price is appropriate. Assume, assume that the land is done like this, and I give a guarantee, right? So the contract is a pair of assume, assumption and guarantees. That's it. So when I do my design, right, I assume what is around me, assumption, and I guarantee that if this assumption are, are right, so they represent the world, then my design does this. It's a contract between my design and the environment. It's as simple as that. Now, Using this notion of contract, then I can, uh, you know, become creative, right? So, for example, we said before that we had the elements of a library, and I wanted to know if I could plug two things together, right? Well, that is a contract, right? Isn't it? So, I, I want to have the word to be represented to me at my pins in this particular way. Is that, if that is the case, then I guarantee you that my performance are like that. Now, this is important because, for example, it, I don't know how many of you do microwave design, but some of you may have done a microwave design course. But remember a 50 ohm rule that you have to have an input impedance of uh, a uh, maximum power trans transfer from module A to module B occurs when you have 50 ohm. That is an assumption, right? Assumption is 50 ohm. Right? So if this component is good in the design, if it's input impedance, is 50 ohm. Assume guarantee. Microwave design, car design, anything. is a general concept. So in, uh, by the same token, when you do modeling, right? so assume, uh, can you cast the problem of doing an abstract model correctly in terms of a contract? You certainly can. If you think about it, it is... I, if this is my lower model, right, so I assume that this is my lower model, then I guarantee that this higher model is representing in a particular space the behavior of this model. So not only you can do the composition based on contracts, you can do also abstraction and refine. Okay. So and that is uh, introducing contracts. So for every component, you associate the contract that says when you can compose things. Okay. And what are the assumptions that you make when you compose things? Okay. Now, uh, so in other words, what I recommend is that for every component, you have a contract around it. The contract says where, where and how I can use the component. If I don't do that, I run the risk of doing all kind of bad stuff. Okay? So enriching components with contracts, I mean, you can call it, instead of calling contracts, you can call it whatever you want. But you have to make it explicit what is your assumption when you do this design. So what are the modeling techniques that we are encountering in this class? We are modeling physical phenomena with ordinary differential equations. In your book, you have lots of examples of helicopters, torque equations in three dimensions, all of that. And that is, in general, who is the guy who writes models 
uh, of components like mechanical components or electric components are the, either the originally are the physicists, right? So the physicists discover the law of nature and then they write the behavior of the component in terms of this equation. Now, now that we know some of these rules, is the engineer. The mechanical engineer writes the, the model, right? So writes what he thinks is important. Now, it's interesting that when you go to design airplanes, for example, you have people that insist in describing every single section of the plane at that level of abstraction. And we want to know if the plane is not going to tip over in, uh, on landing. I mean, have you seen how big is a 787 or a 747? Now, you can never do that. And then you tell them, look, I, you know, it's fine. You know, we, we are good. You know, we can do many things in, ED, in electronic design automation, in design automation. But this is way too much, right? Oh, then I don't trust the result. I have to build the plane. I say, dunk. No, depends which question you ask. And if you ask the question if the airplane is going to tilt over, you don't need to represent everything at the level of partial differential equation of the components. But most of engineers that do this kind of design are still used to say that the more detailed the model is, the better it is. And of course, it's like, you know, I wishy-washy thinking, you know, ha-ha, uh, I do that, so I, I save my ass, right? So this is, a, you know, the, the most detailed model. So something goes wrong, you know, it's not my fault. It's the fault of Newton. It's the fault of uh, Heisenberg. It's not my fault, right? But you have to take your responsibility in building the models. Okay, ODS. Feedback control system. Feedback control system, you can have analog feedback, Right? So, for example, our body is all based on feedback loops. Right? So, uh, why don't we fall when we, co when we walk? There is a feedback loop. Right? So, it's a pressure that we feel from our legs, then what we see, close the loop, and the force that I apply to my legs are such that I don't tilt over. Right? In this case, not a plane, it's a human that tilts over. Okay. So, now, how do you, uh, but most of the control loops that are in use today use microprocessors. And microprocessors are using algorithms, and algorithms are discrete, right, and not continuous. And so there is a time uh, domain modeling is in the discrete sense. It's not in the continuous sense. All these are continuous time. The notion of time is something that is continuous. It's a continuous value a real, uh, on the real axis. Modeling modal behavior. Modal behavior is, um, uh, you, you would uh, <clears throat> think about, you know, when you drive a car, uh, you don't know, but it is done that way. There are modes in which the car operates. So, for example, when you accelerate, right, the car, that is a mode. Right? When you take your pedal off, that's another mode. When you brake, that's another mode. When you start the car, that's another mode. So each one of these, why do you determine these modes? Why do you talk about these different modes of driving? Because for each mode, there is a different controller that works best in terms of the uh, engine and all. Doing a general global controller for all the possible way in which the car is going to run is out of the question. It's too complicated. And so you break it down, right? It's the usual problem of, uh, of design is also breaking down into manageable parts. So you break it down. Each of these parts is a mode, right? And so when you say that you are in a mode, think about a diagram uh, that represents a mode with a node, right? And so when you go from one mode to the next, you put an arc and you say, zoom. This is a possible transition. So is it possible to go from full acceleration all at once into full braking? No, because you have to lift the pedal, unless you are crazy and you put both, both at the same time. But if you uh, drive as any human does, is that you take off your pedal and then you apply the braking action, then it means that you go through two modes, from acceleration to braking, right? So that is this modal thing. And this is called a finite state machine. So it's a number of states, and you are transitioning from state to state according to a particular input. Foot down, this mode. Foot up, transition. So the cause of that transition is foot up, right? So the input is my foot position, okay? That's finite state machine. Modeling sensor and actuators, well, you know, 
that is a special case of a hardware. So you have to look at calibration noise and so on. Modeling software. Remember, a software is a very interesting object because per se doesn't have a performance associated. It depends on which platform it runs on. That's the reason why platform-based design is so important to export the characteristic of a platform. Software doesn't have time in it. It's uh, is, uh, orthogonal to the notion of physical time. And so the only thing that you can talk about is concurrency. It thinks so, are independent. So the notion of time is partial order in the case of software. It's not time like 0 0.1 second doesn't have that dimension. When you marry the software to a particular microprocessor, you can talk about execution time. And then modeling networks, latencies, error rates, packet loss, all of these kind of things, which explains that for every layer, for every kind of object that I have, I will have a different model, meaning that I focus on particular issues that are of importance when I use that component. And so these are examples, so I'd, I'd rather uh, you read it. So the most important thing is uh, just simply how you write the equation of uh, using uh, ordinary differential equation, how you build torque models, and uh, this one. It, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, any one of you has done uh, basic mechanics is able to recover this equation. But the most important thing is that the use of this equation, the use of equation is for design. And using equation for design means asking the right question to the model and using the right level of abstraction. So what I instead want to focus on is, okay, is this thing, is the exercise. So what you could do is that based on what you have in your book, try to think about uh, reformulating the helicopter model so that it has two inputs instead of one, and then try to simulate the behavior of an helicopter uh, using MATLAB or simulate. Okay. Now, uh, the question then uh, that I would like you to think about is that can the equation of a controller be implemented in software or not? And this is not as trivial a question as it may seem because a controller, when you develop the control laws, you are assuming that you are working in real time, and in time, continuous time. Now, when you implement the, uh, the controller, you have to use a discrete time. So you have a change of space, right? And changing the space may not preserve the properties. Um, now, other modeling techniques that we'll talk about in the future classes, state machine, synchronous reactive models, data flow models, discrete event models, time-driven, continuous time model. Now, what is the difference between all these modeling techniques? It's a notion of time. So time is the most important thing that you have to think about. And notice that it's not only a question of engineering and physics. You know, Einstein built all his relativity based on this. It's also in philosophical terms. So time is really something that has enthused humans since uh, the beginning. Right? So we will discuss all of these different uses of time. And this will be done in the next lecture. So see you on Tuesday. <laughs>